And we'll begin. So I assume that you all decided you're ready to spend that much time doing math. And that's wonderful if you are. You scared me a little bit. Yeah. There's <laughs> a lot of students, never seen a class that's dedicated to learning math before. You're definitely beating the average by far. All right, let's begin. Discrete math is the name of this class. And while we'll be going over a lot of interesting different types of maths in this class, the focus of this class is not necessarily to learn those maths. The focus of this class is to learn how to logic and deductively reason. That's the focus. We're using math as a medium to do that. Does that make sense? All right. So what do we mean by deductive reasoning? Sometimes it's good to have contrast so you understand the different types of reasoning. Deductive reasoning, in its uh, most straightforward language, is it's the logical implication of a given set of assumptions. Now that probably went over your head, so let's give an example, then I'll say it again. The common example is statement A, Socrates is a man. Statement B, all men are mortal. Logical implication of those two statements is Socrates is mortal. That's deductive reasoning. It's a logical implication. It's, it's, it's knowledge to the extent mankind can obtain knowledge. If we know anything, we know that those two statements imply the third statement. We know that if all men are mortal and if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. That's a logical implication. That's truth to the extent mankind knows truth. We didn't say that Socrates is a man. We didn't say that all men are mortal. We said if Socrates is a man and if all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. You see the difference? Math, mathematics language is very careful in that. We never say that this is true. We say if this is true, then this also is true. You see the difference? And that, the fact that these statements imply this statement, us knowing that, that's knowledge to the extent that mankind can attain knowledge. Every other statement we make is a weaker statement than that or logically equivalent in strength to that. So let's go over what we mean with a couple more examples. Inductive reasoning is the reasoning of science. It's the reason that you all think the sun's going to come out tomorrow. Why do you think the sun's going to come out tomorrow? Because every day of your life, every time you've gone outside and waited a 24-hour interval, that sun sure just came up. It's the same reason that you think, when I drop this eraser, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. So inductive reasoning is the reasoning that every time I've tried it, it's been true. It's worked every time I've tried it. This is the reasoning that science uses. You've probably often heard in a science class, you can't prove science right, you can only prove it wrong. The reason that they say that is you have to use inductive reasoning in science. And so they keep trying it, and every time it's true, they keep saying we're good, we're good, we're good, until they try it once and it doesn't work. Then they throw out the theory, and they pick a new theory, right? But just because it's never been wrong doesn't make it true. Do you understand that? Because I can pick a lot of things that are obviously false and give you infinite examples where it's true. For example, I say every number is even. Check it out. Look at this number. Two. Look at this number. Four. Six. Eight. You tell me how many examples you want and I can give you that many examples. Therefore, every number is even, right? No, it's not good reasoning. Now, it's the best reasoning we can use when it comes to science. We have to look at the universe, see what's happening, and make our best guesses based off of what we've seen. We can't look at everything that's possible to happen. So there's natural limitations. So inductive reasoning is your first step into the world of science. And when you use inductive reasoning, you use probabilities. You say, based off of how many times I've tried it, there's this percent chance that that's going to happen again. Does that make sense? So we'll come back around to inductive reasoning, but let's move on to abductive for a second. Abductive reasoning is reasoning you use most of your life. Uh, it's almost the reasoning of, it's the best explanation I can come up with. That's the type of reasoning it is. It's hard to give a good, solid definition for this. But here's the example I like to use to help you, give you intuition for what abductive reasoning is. You're in a room with your little sibling, chocolate chip cookie, they're two years old. You put the chocolate chip cookie down in front of them. 
You leave the room, you shut the door. You wait a minute. You open the door, you go back in the room. The cookie's gone, there's crumbs all over the kid and some little chocolate on the kid's face. Conclusion, the two-year-old ate the chocolate chip cookie. But for all you know, Big Brother is a little bit clever. He was hiding in the closet the whole time. As soon as you sat down that cookie and left the room, Big Brother went over, ate the cookie, saved the chocolate chip, smeared it on the kid's mouth, and then went back to hiding in the closet. You come in the room, you see the kid with the chocolate chip smeared on their face. You think they ate the cookie. Doesn't make it true, but it's the best conclusion you can come to. Come to. This is the type of reasoning that we have to use in like a court of law. Here, when you prove something, they typically say proof beyond a reasonable doubt is what they mean by proof here. Does that make sense? So here, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Inductive reasoning, we do proofs with probabilities. We said we're 99.968% sure that this is true, based off of how many times we've tested it. Here, when we prove something, we mean it's impossible for it to be false. Not every time we've tried it, it's true. Not even it's true 100% of the time. And we'll go over the difference between true 100% of the time and impossible to be false, because they're not the same statement. Impossible to be false is a much stronger statement than true 100% of the time. We'll talk about that when we get to probability statistics. So this is, we're sure within this probability it's true. This is true beyond reasonable doubt. This is impossible to be false. This is the reasoning that we're interested in in this class. And to give you an example of what we mean by reasoning, reasoning is how you justify a statement. If you say, I know statement A because of statement B, B is the reason you know A. Does that make sense? That's what we mean by reasoning. Okay. So math versus science. What's the big difference? Math, we only ever use this reasoning. Does that mean science never uses this reasoning? No, how does science work? The goal of science is to try something a whole bunch of times using inductive reasoning and then make some assumption based off of that inductive reasoning. So we try something a whole bunch of times, it keeps happening, it keeps happening. We assume, ah, every time I drop this, any of you take physics? You know what acceleration is? Yes. All right, so here we are, Galileo, a long time ago. And he keeps dropping objects and carefully measuring them as they fell. And he says, every time I measure it, it looks like that object's accelerating downwards at 9.81 meters per second squared. It's just units of acceleration. But the point is, they keep accelerating downwards at the same rate no matter what the object is. So Galileo comes along and he makes an assumption. He says, ah, oh, acceleration on the surface of the Earth, when you put an object in free fall, is always equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. That's an assumption that he makes based off of inductive reasoning. Once we have this number for accel acceleration, then we start using math to apply to that number. We start saying, if this is true, then this is true. If this is true, then this is true. If this is true, then this is true. And based off of this one assumption, I can determine exactly where that marker is going to be two seconds after I threw it, assuming I knew the initial conditions. And physics is very interested in questions like that, developing math mo mathematical models like that. And I lost my marker. That's what happens when you throw stuff. So the ultimate goal of all of science is to get whatever scientific phenomena they're talking about reduced to a mathematical model. That's what you're trying to do. You start out with some, you try to get some assumption, a science of number to it, and that's the beginning of science. And then from there on out, you can use math, right? Once I have that, this is the acceleration of an object, I can start calculating where it's going to be if I know it's right here. Where's it going to be in two seconds? And you can start doing those types of calculations, and that's called kinematics. That's where you start when you take physics, which I highly recommend. It's a great course. Anyways, so that's math versus science. Once you get to science, you're talking about probabilities. When we say that in the field of physics that we know something is true, what does that mean? Or when we say that something is a scientific fact in the world of physics, what does that mean? We say that we are 99.9999% sure. That's what we mean. We can't ever know for sure for sure in science, right? You can't prove science right, you can only prove it wrong. That's what you've heard over and over again. So you can't know for sure, you can just get more and more and more confident in your answer. Does that make sense? So when you've got 99.999% confidence, then you're in the realm of physics. 
And if you pick any scientific field you want, I don't care. I randomly chose psychology. Pick any random scientific field you want. And if you were to say, what is at the heart of this field? It reduces to another field. And if you say, what's at the heart of this field? It reduces to another field. Now, I don't know if this leap is right. I don't know how much of psychology is in the actual layout of the brain. Maybe I should put like neurobiology. And neurobiology is a special field of biology. And all biology reduces to chemistry. And all chemistry reduces to physics. Do you understand what I'm saying there? What, human anatomy is on the brain? I don't know. That's what I said. I might have Let's get rid of that. Let's put. No, that's what you said. Well, I didn't know how much human anatomy has to do with the layout of the actual brain. Oh. This is why I was saying, how much of psychology is just based off the layout of the brain and they're saying this connection is made this way? Right, yeah, right. I don't know. But, neural. Good students can see all macros. 
There's no problem with that. So that's kind of the hierarchy of what we mean when we say we know something. Here, impossible to be false. And then we have different percentage of confidence intervals based off of the field that we're in. Does that make sense? Okay. Now discrete math versus your math experience and the big difference here. We already talked a little bit about this, but your math experience up till now has been a lot of teachers walking you through maybe a derivation or proof of some formula, and then you use a formula over and over again with a bunch of problems. And then you get a new formula and you use it over and over again. That's not going to be the case here. I want to give you ideas, and you're going to have to put those ideas together to prove other ideas. And there is no guaranteed pattern that you can use that gets you from point A to point B. There's no tricks, there's no cheat sheet, there's nothing you can do except for train your mind to deductively reason. There's no shortcut. Does that mean there's always one definite answer? When you prove something, you prove it. There's different ways to prove the same thing. I could do several proofs of the Pythagorean theorem, for example. But once it's proven, it's proven. For example, it's not possible for you to disprove the Pythagorean theorem, starting from the same premise as I did. Based off of the postulates of geometry, the Pythagorean theorem is true. Your opinion doesn't mean squat about it. It's proven. Does that make sense? So you could prove it one way, and I could prove it another way. But if it's true, we both come to a conclusion it's true. It's impossible for me and you to start with the same premises, have valid proofs both going down different paths, and come to opposite conclusions. That can't happen. Does that make sense? Good question. So your answers will vary in the sense that your answers are proofs, which is like you write a little explanation. And the way that you think and interpret something is different than the way that he does. But I'm very familiar with all this stuff, and chances are, if you can follow your line of thinking that comes to about conclusions, so can I. And if I have questions about your proofs, I'll ask you as the year goes on. But in general, I've been able to follow my students' proofs pretty well. Um, okay, so here's your first little taste of the type of thinking you have to use. So this isn't really a discrete math problem, but it gives you a sense of what this class kind of requires from you mentally. So this problem right here, I want each of you to try solving. You figure it out. Don't tell anyone. Did you guys already figure it out before class and share answers? No? All right. So see if you can solve this problem. And do you understand what this dot, dot, dot means? X minus A times X minus B times X minus C times X minus B times dot, 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 all the way to X minus Z. So this is the whole alphabet. What does it equal when you multiply all that out? Figure it out. Don't share your answer out loud. Keep working with it. And when you get it, you get it. But until you get it, you don't get it. So go ahead, start thinking about it, see if you can start solving it. Worst case scenario, you know how they expand out 26 terms, right? You have? Yeah. Oh, shoot.
I got it. Raise your hand if you think you figured it out. So, all right. Think you got it? Let's see, who doesn't have syllabus? You don't. You don't. You don't. All right, we'll pause for a second to go over the syllabus. Um, the textbook that we're going to be used, using. Uh, I will give you a PDF of it. Uh, if you want a hard copy, I know my brother James, if any of you know him, purchased one when he took the class from me. So, you could try and get a hard copy from him if you'd like. But I will email you all out a copy. I already tried to do that from Canvas, but I'll also personally collect your emails and do it again to make sure you get the book. Not Canvas, sorry. Great book. Canvas is what the university I went to use for all their online stuff. Anyways. So let's go over it real quick. Homework. Homework is due the week after it is assigned. In other words, I will assign you homework today, it's due next week. Or in this case, this Friday. 
Now, that's real dense to have all that homework done that quickly. So, for the first chapter homework, I will accept homework until we do the chapter one test, which is week three. Oh, that still only gives you one week. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Why do we already have a chapter test? Yeah, so we will be having a chapter test next week. <laughs> Oh, we take a right. test on each chapter? Yes, That's you take a test on a chapter basis. And the chap test will only be like an hour long, so we'll still do material on the days when we have a test. And you'll also go home with homework on the day you have a test. Keep you busy. Yeah. Six hours is a lot of time to fill, so we'll fill it. Now, I make homework 50% of your grade in this class. The reason I am so generous there is because there is, you can study till you're blue in the face and there's still no guarantee you're going to figure out how to do that problem on the test. You could have been doing algebra from the day you were born and if I gave you this problem, it just might get stuck on it. And there's no way for me to train you on how to be ready for every type of problem that might come your way. Either you're gonna figure it out or you're not. And that's just the way that it is. There's no tips, there's no tricks, there is on a problem by problem basis, but there's no overall guidelines I can give you to make sure that you're ready to prove anything that comes your way. So it's expected that you're gonna get kind of bad scores on your tests. Because being ready to prove anything, chances are there's something that's just gonna stump you. And you just gotta move on. You just can't sit there and think about it forever. So that's why we're so generous with homework, because homework, you have all the time in the world to figure out your proofs, right? You guys don't have lives, so. Yeah, we don't. All the time in the world. All the time. <laughs> now, because that test, once again, are kind of hard in this class, I will also use your midterm. You'll take the midterm at the end of first semester. I'll use your midterm grade to replace your lowest test grade, assuming you didn't get worse on your midterm than all your other tests. <laughs> Similarly, your final will replace your worst semester two test score. Does that make sense? So if your worst test score at the end of semester one is 60%, and then when you take the midterm at the end of the semester, you get 80%, I'll go back to the test that you got 60% on and switch it to an 80%. But if your worst test score throughout the semester is 80%, then you get 60% on your midterm. It won't affect any other test scores. So it can only help you. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what those are, and then extra credit, you have up to 5% extra credit in this class. Students always come to me at the end of the semester, at the end of the year, crying about, what can I do for extra credit? And they want some easy assignment to get a lot of extra credit. That's not how it's gonna work. You will have extra credit on every homework assignment that you can do as we go throughout the year, and on every test that you do as we go throughout the year. There's not gonna be, at the end of the year, you come to me, you just need 1% of extra credit, and you're willing to do something to do it, no, 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 it doesn't work. Are you gonna check each homework for, for the extra credit box? Yes, I'm gonna check your homework in general. Now this is a big class, so I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. Probably gonna have to come up with a rule that I randomly pick two problems, and then your score on those problems is your score on your homework. No. Oh. I know that's bad, but law of large numbers, if you understand math, it all averages out. You could get unlucky, you could get lucky. Law of large numbers. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do yet. That's a lot of proofs to read through and follow your logic on. It's, yeah. This class is the hardest class to grade homework on. It's not like trick where I can just say, did you get the right answer, and then if you did a really quick look at it, even if you got the right answer in this class, you might just give it a bunch of bull crap that got the right answer. I don't care if you got the right answer in this class, I care what your logic valid. So if you decide to get the wrong answer when it's all said and done, valid logic is going to get you a much bigger score than if you got the right answer, but your logic is crap, you got zero on the assignment altogether, because I'm done grading. Let's talk about cheating for a little bit, because I'm tired of dealing with it. My trick class last year burned me out. I'm done dealing with cheating. I've tried to be kind of soft about it, say, hey, let's quit this. You know, this should be the type of thing that we do. I'm done with cheating, I'm just gonna kick you out of class. So don't cheat. Just fail if you're gonna fail, pass if you're gonna pass. Getting kicked out of class is a guaranteed fail. And it's really, really hard for you to not know something and give me a proof where you do know something and have it not like any of the proofs of the people around you. So I'm reading through all your proofs. Don't cheat. Let's not have to deal with this problem. That's, I'm just done. Try to be nice about it. Just face my job way harder. So the lazy answer is I'm just gonna kick you out of class and I'm cheating. Now I'm gonna be lazy for resisting students. 
I worked with you two years, and there was less of it. <laughs> All right. So that's the syllabus. Any questions on the syllabus? Maybe look at week one so you get an example of how this works. So if you look under week one, I say we're going through sections one through four on the book. You'll know what those are when you look at the book. Homework, 1.1, that means you do problem one from section one. 3.1, that means you do problem one from section three. 3.5, that means you do problem five from section three. And then you'll notice there's that extra credit problem. And it's very well labeled. I require that you at least read the first extra credit problem because it's going to introduce terminology that you just need to know in general. But outside of that, extra credit is just if you would like to. So earn your extra credit as the year goes on. Don't come to me at the end of the year when you need an extra percent or an extra 2%. I'm not going to do it. Now's your chance to start getting extra credit. And it's hard because it's extra credit. Extra credit means you win well above you beyond. So for those of you who love getting good percentages, it's possible to get 105% this class. Okay. So any other questions about the syllabus? I really wish I didn't throw my one good marker. Boom, there it is. Good on that? All right, now how many of you are still working on this problem? You're still working on it? You're the only one? Everyone else figured it out? I have an idea, but I don't understand it. Huh? What's your answer? Zero. Wonderful. The answer is zero. Why is the answer zero? Because we go for all that when you get to one, it says x minus x equals zero, so if you don't file a minor, then you get to zero. Too. Exactly. You got eventually an x minus x term. Right. Which is zero. And anything times zero is zero. That's how you solve the problem. So that type of thinking is the type of that's my best shot at giving you a sense of the type of thinking you gotta do in this class. You've got to think about it until you're able to make that leap. And when you make the leap, the problem's easy, right? Yeah. But until you make that leap, the problem's hard. And there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to make that leap. Right? All right. So that's a cool problem to help introduce you to the type of thinking that we use in this class. Now, the words that we use in this class. Uh, a statement that people think they know prior to that. One of the things I try and help students understand is, in this class, you are, for the first time in many of your lives, probably, going to obtain knowledge to the extent you can obtain knowledge. Same thing I told my class last year. And they said, that's not true, I know tons of things. I said, tell me something you know, just one thing that you are sure that you know. Some brave soul says, the sky is blue. <laughs> And I had to give it to him, right? The sky's obviously blue. Does anyone not know that the sky's blue? So you all know the sky's blue. Right. And you're darn sure that you know the sky's blue? Well, now I can start asking some really simple questions. What's the sky? Is my finger in the sky? How about now? How about now? How about now? What's blue? <laughs> anyone got blue? What's blue? Don't say a color or you're going out. Red's a color, black's a color. What's blue? I want to know what blue is. Don't say this, that's just an example of what's blue. What is blue? Tell me what blue is. You claim to know the sky is blue, but you can't tell me what the sky is, and you can't tell me what blue is. So something I don't know is something I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you know the sky is blue? That's a bold statement in the world of math. So what is blue? And I'm telling you, when you try to argue these things, you're going to have to come back to mathematical definitions. If you want to argue about blue, is you say, well, if a photon has a frequency that's in between this range and this range, we classify it as blue. Then I have to say, yeah, but what's a photon? Oh, well, the mathematical model we have for a photon is a sine wave that has these properties. Oh, so now we're back to math, and you give it a mathematical definition of exactly what you mean. And unless you do that with your words, you're going to find out real quick that if someone's willing to question you, you don't know what you're talking about. The sky is blue. What do you mean? You have intuition for what that means. But that is not what we're talking about here. 
We're not here to develop intuition. We're here to develop understanding. You are going to know everything that we cover in this class, hopefully, if you keep up with the class. Everything we cover, you are going to know. Not you're going to have strong intuition for. You're going to know. So let's give you an example with a definition of something we're going to talk a lot about. Even. You would all guess you know what an even number is. So I tell you, what's an even? An integer is called even, provided it is divisible by 2. Now we can do exactly what we did with the statement the sky is blue here. We can start tearing this apart. And we can say, uh, integer, what's that? Uh, divisible, what's that? Uh, 2, what's that? And we can take issue with each of those terms, right? And force them to say exactly what they mean. Okay? You with me so far? You see how you can challenge a statement? All right. So you can, these are three terms that you've got to define if you're going to say that this is its definition, if you want that to have meaning, right? So let's go over what each of these are. Now, unfortunately, we have to start somewhere. And I can't take you all the way back to developing the natural numbers and giving you the definition of zero, and then using zero to define one, and using one to define two, and using two to define three. We can. And we could start all our definitions with a simple function and a simple definition for the number zero. But we're not going to do that in this class. So here are some of the assumptions we are going to make in this class. I'm going to already assume that you know what two is. I'm not going to tell you that two is the second thing one and zero. You won't hear me say that. <laughs> what did you just say? Uh, this, is a, this is a fun class. Guys, yeah, really, pay attention, don't you? <laughs> What's two? It's the set containing one and zero. What's one? It's the set containing zero. What's zero? It's the empty set. Anyways, so this one we're going to kind of speak behind the rug and pretend that you already know numbers, even though we really shouldn't. And we should go all the way back. We just don't have time to go all the way back because this is only one class that we can do. But there are classes that do that. You can go and develop this if you'd like. And it is well defined. So the integers. Let's talk about what an integer is and what the integers are. So first off, that's a fancy z. We did a z with an extra line this way. This is a shorthand notation to represent a set of integers. This is this. So you know what the integers are? Is 10 an integer? 10 is an integer. What about negative 52? Yeah? Yes. Oh, someone remembers. You can talk. <laughs> you have those. We, we won't get to that. <laughs> you can talk. All right. What about 56? Is that an integer? Yes. What about 10 halves? Yes. 10 halves? Oh, well, yeah, 10 halves is 5 is an integer. Yeah. We're good. What about 0? Zero? 0 halves? Yes. yes. 0 thirds? Yes. Square root of 2 times 0? Yes. Yes. All right. Wait, what? <laughs> Square root of 2 times 0 is 0. Oh. is an integer. Right. All right. So you feel like you know what the integers are? Yes. Again, not a great definition because we've got to begin somewhere in this class. We can't develop all of math as we go. So we're going to assume they already know what numbers are. We're going to give this loose definition to integers. And now the visible will give you a rigorous definition. So what do we mean by divisible? Let A and B be integers. We say that A is divisible by B, provided there is an integer C such that A equals BC. So let's see examples, and then I think the definition will pop out at you what exactly we're saying. So you already have the intuition for what divisible means. The way you typically said it is it goes into it an even number of times. Is 6 divisible by 3? Yeah, because 3 goes into it twice. So how did I know that 3 divides 6 or that 6 is divisible by 3? We knew that because there is some integer, namely 2, such that 2 times 3 equals 6. Let's do another one. Give me a number. 58, what's it divisible by? 2. two. How do you know that 2 divides 58, or that 58 is divisible by 2? 
Well, we're defining, we're talking about divisible here. Don't go back to even, which uses that word divisible. Let's get divisible, then we'll talk even. What do you mean? <laughs> Two times. You can separate it. 26. Oh, okay. Because What's two times 30? 60. Minus two? 58. 58. So two times what is 58? 29. Thank you. So you know that two divides 58 because there is an integer, namely 29, such that 29 times two gives you 58. Does two divide nine? No. No. There is no integer a I can write such that 2a equals 9. You can't find one that makes that true. 0 doesn't work. 1 doesn't work. 2 doesn't work. 3 doesn't work. 4 doesn't work. 5 doesn't work. 6 doesn't work. You can't do it. Feel like you understand divisible? All right. Is 10 divisible by 10? Yes. You can't just let them say that? Is, you say yeah? Why? Because one. Because one times ten is ten. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Uh, does six divide zero? Yeah. Zero is divisible by six? Oh, no. Does six divide zero, or is zero divisible by six? Are both logically equivalent ways of reading that statement? Is this statement true or false? Does six divide zero? False. False. Raise your hand if you think it's true, since you don't know how to talk. We got two? Oh, they pulled a third. Does that make you a second guess? <laughs> if six divides zero, then what? Six times what equals zero? Zero. Zero! Oh, there is one! Right. No. So six times zero, zero equals zero. <laughs> Look at it. Two divides 58 means that there's an integer, namely 29, such so that 29 times two equals 58. Six divides zero. What? Six divide zero, or zero is divisible okay, by six. What about zero? Oh, there's a great question. Does zero divide zero? That's not what I meant. What are you asking? Six and the other zero. Yeah. Oh, is that true? <laughs> That's what I thought. Does zero said. divide six? No. No. That's what I meant. Zero times x equals six. What can x be? Nothing. Nothing. What's zero times x? Zero. zero. Is zero equal to six? No. Oh, okay. So yes, you're right. That was the next one I was going to ask. Feel like you're understanding this divides? All right. So I have a question. Go ahead. Your notation of it. We're used to seeing uh, that divisible sign as more of a fraction. Okay. So I think that that's let's a make something very clear right now. We are not talking about divided by. We are not talking about division. Put division far out of your head for this class. When we're ready for division, we'll define it. Okay. <laughs> the operations that you are expected to know right now are add, multiply, and what an integer is. That's all that exists. Now we just define divisible. Notice we divide, define divisible in terms of multiplication. So the only operations that you know now are plus, multiply, and Divisible. I can say divide, but I'm afraid you'll think division. Right. So that's a very good point. This happened over and over and over again. My students got confused. When we were talking about divisible, they thought division. Right? When I say 5 divides 2, that's just a false statement. 5 divided by 2 is a number. Okay. Very different ideas. Another way that you can read it is... 5 is a factor of 2, if you're more comfortable with that kind of language. Does that make sense? All right. Let's cover one more. Does negative 2 divide 2? Yeah. How do you know? Because you multiply by negative 1. Right. There exists some integer, namely negative 1, such that negative 1 times negative 2 gives you 2. Right? It's going to be very hard for you guys to stop using your intuition and go back to definitions. First thing you do when you come
come across a problem is make sure you understand exactly what the words are, and then you're most likely going to be looking up your definitions over and over and over again to remember what exactly they give you, what exactly they tell you. So let's go over this definition one more time. Make sure it just makes perfect sense, clear as day. Let A and B be integers, meaning we only define divisibility with integers. We're not talking about anything else. This symbol only applies to integers. With me so far? That's the first requirement that this definition is making. We say that A is divisible by B, or that B divides A, provided there is an integer C such that A equals B times C. That means A is divisible by B, or B divides A. It's logically equivalent to the statement. So if you're doing math and you come along somewhere, and you say 6 equals 2 times 3, you can instantly say 2 divides 6 and 3 divides 6. That is the same statement as that. They're logically equivalent. That is the same statement as that. They're logically equivalent. That's what this is telling us. This is what we mean by that symbol. Good? Okay. That's... Wait, that is not right. What? That is equivalent to that. 2 divided 6 is equivalent to the fact that there is some integer, okay, namely 3. They capture the same information. Okay. Right? I guess. Well, from this you can conclude this, from this you can conclude this. If I just told you that, you could then conclude that, which gives you that. So any one of those statements, you can find the other two. That's what I mean. That make sense? Okay, let's go back and figure out what our next definition is. Odd. Trying to use the same variables that he does. Uh, one more note about this book. This book is such an excellent book for the students. I cannot, I know you're all not going to for some reason, but if you would read the textbook before you came to class, it is just going to make the world a difference for you between things just being easy or you're struggling all through class. This author does such a good job. Most textbooks I don't recommend reading all the way through. The author sometimes makes you struggle to figure things out on your own. It's just hard. This author does such a great job of spelling things out for you. And furthermore, what he does in a lot of sections to help get you comfortable with proving is he gives you what are called proof templates. So he slowly walks you through the idea of proving certain things over and over again. That's something that I don't have the time to do in class. So I just give you the full proof. But in the textbook, he slowly tries to walk you through it, walk you through the logic that he's using so that you can completely understand. And he tries to get you to almost like get your mind to just guess the next thing he's going to do over and over again. So he does such a good job getting you comfortable with proving. Chances are none of you are really that comfortable with proving. Most students aren't. It's rare that I get a student who says, oh yeah, I've got to look first. So this textbook just does an immaculate job. It took me a long time to find this textbook. Not really. It's the one I used when I went to college. And I thought it was just amazing. Second favorite textbook I've ever had. All right, odd. That's what happens when I keep mixing up my markers. That one feels cold. I could have been using that one. One of you. A is called odd provided I say there exists or there it is. There is an integer x such that I may do that a lot in this class. S dot T dot for such that. 
don't know, did I do it down here? No, oh, I did. Probably didn't take the time to specify. I may do that a lot. I'm not aware that I do it, and there's probably other weird writing habits that I have that I'm just gonna do. So when you see weird stuff like that, uh, stop me, make me explain it. I've been writing this so much, it's hard for me, my brain to think about what my audience already knows. Does that make sense? Okay. It's kind of like you have to, to explain, I don't know, wall. Right? Wall? Yes. <laughs> All right. So an integer a is called odd, provided there is an integer x such that a equals 2x plus 1. Alright. Let's see an example. What's an odd integer? 3. 3. How do you know 3 is odd? Because there is an integer. Yeah, what's the integer I can plug in there to get 3? 1. 1. Alright. Pick another one. What's another odd integer? 7. 7. 7. What's the integer I can plug in there to get 7? 3. 3. Right? Let's do another one. 72. What's the number I can plug in there to get 72? Even. There isn't one. So it must not be odd. Give me another odd. 91. 91. What's the number I can plug in? 45. Holy cow. Come on. <laughs> what's another one? 73. 73. And what's the number? Oh. 36, thank you. You get it? Yeah. You get the definition? Makes sense? Yep. Alright. That's what it means for a number to be odd. You now know what an odd number is. Wow. You go home and you tell your parents. <laughs> you learned it even, you learned it odd. It's been a full day. <laughs> Crying. seen before. So I liked you. I said we were only going to use plus multiplication. Looks like we're also using greater than. Greater than. Are we all comfortable with what that says? Yes. Yeah. The greater than symbol. I don't know why it doesn't define it. It's not that hard. I guess because we have to define some term. Never mind, sorry. Um, provided P is greater than 1, and the only positive divisors, P is greater than 1, and the only positive divisors of P is 1 and P. Right? Question, what's the smallest prime number? Three, two. One. An even can't be prime. It's divisible by two. Well, that's only that's one. Is two prime? Yes. yes. Who buys that? You buy it's prime? I buy it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> what are the divisors of two? One and two. One two. The number itself and one. It's prime. Why is it one prime? Because there'd be one and one, which is only one in itself. Yeah. So you're telling me one's not prime? P is greater than ah, one. read the whole definition. Yeah. A positive integer p. Oh, an integer p. We don't have to say positive because this makes positive. An integer p is called prime, prime provided it's greater than one, and its only divisors are one and p. Does that make sense? So you know what prime numbers are? 2, 3, 5, 7, 9. Wait, what's a prime? There you go. Not 9. What do you mean, what's a prime? It's not just a prime number. Alright. And I'm guessing.
composite comes next. Oh, um, got to make one more side note about this housekeeping. So they're doing a strict no phone policy this year, which is too bad because your book is virtual. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry about that. Tough life. No phone at all. No phone at all. They're confiscating on-site title. Something to that effect. I don't remember exactly what they said. But it's too bad because typically I'd have my students use their phones. But they count with a hard no phone policy, so be aware of that. Can't have phones. The book is virtual. Are we gonna You can bring laptops to class, you can bring tablets to class, iPads to class, and just don't want phones. So the phone's one device that they don't have allowed. I guess you can use an iPod. In class? I mean approved things in class, but you need I I don't know. I'm just letting you know. I don't know what you're gonna need. I know that I would want access to the textbook in class. So be aware of that. Sorry about that. All right, composite. What is a composite number? Nice. <laughs> Positive integer, A, is called composite provided there is an integer B such that 1 is less than B is less than A and B divides A. So let's make sense of this real quick. Make sure you understand the definition. So first off, you have intuition for what a composite number is, right? 6 is a composite number, 10 is a composite number. So a positive integer A it's called composite, provided there is an integer b between 1 and a, such that b divides a. So how do I know 10 is composite? Because it's divisible by 2 and it's divisible by 5. 2 is an integer between 1 and 10 that 10 is divisible by. 5 is an integer between 1 and 10 that 10 is divisible by. by. Right? Does that make sense? All right. Is eight composite? Yes. How do you know? Two. two and four. Wonderful. Two is a number between one and eight, and two divides eight. Four is a number between one and eight, and four divides eight. Do you have to have two? Well, they have to become in pairs, because if you get one, you get the other. Two times four is eight. That gives you two of them. They have to become in pairs. Wait, what? <laughs> Two times four is eight, right? So when you find two integers that multiply together to give you the number that we're talking about, then you instantly found two b's that satisfy this. Okay, but how does that make eight? Yeah. Eight is composite. How do I know that eight is composite? Because it has two different ones, or what? No, because it has at least one. So I know that 1 is less than 2 is less than 8, and that 2 divides 8. Okay, so that makes it a composite number. That makes it a composite number. The end. Okay, so what do you mean there's a million? Well, what's another one for 8? There's just 2 and 4. Not 8. Oh, there's a million composite numbers? Yeah. Well, there's a lot more than a million. There's infinite. Oh. <laughs> okay. It's just a test to but see if the number's composite. Or they might say, prove a composite number is da 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 da. Oh, okay. If you're proving with composite numbers, you know what? You can use this information and this information. So that's what a composite integer is. Is 2 prime? Yeah. Yes. 
So is 2 composite. So is every positive integer that's not prime composite? Yes. Yes? No? Yes. yes sir. Who says yes? Let's see those hands. Hi and proud. Congratulations! You're all wrong! What? There's one exception, and it's one. <laughs> one is a positive integer. It is not prime, and it is not composite. I thought we said one was. Oh, no. Nope. It's not prime because it has to be greater than one. Right. And it's not composite because you're not going to find any positive divisors of 1 that are between 1 and 1. Right. There are no numbers between 1 and 1. Right? Right. Okay. It's nice to fail some class, isn't it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Alright. All right. We'll do a break and we'll come back and talk about theorems. Uh, as soon as enough you can get back, I just start teaching. So oh, okay. <laughs> I recommend around 10 minutes. kids. <laughs>
BT32359 at GMM. We all back? Yes. Yes. Alright, so now we're moving to section 4 material. Section 4 material is on theorems. Uh, now I'm going to get up on what's that explanation. So a theorem is a proven mathematical statement. In general, what you'll be working with in this class is definitions and theorems. So you'll be given definitions which give meaning to some word, like composite, and then you will use that to prove theorems. And then you will use theorems to prove more theorems, and theorems to prove more theorems, and theorems to prove more theorems. You kind of build a web of mathematics. Maybe I'll just explain something. There's four components to every mathematical system. There's what we call undefined terms. Why do you have to have undefined terms? Any of you ever looked at a dictionary? What? There's these books out there, they're called dictionaries. You can look up words in them and it gives you the what of the word. Definition. The definition of the word. And when you look up the definition of the word, what do you see a bunch of? More words. More words. So what are you going to do? Go look up all those words again. And when you look up all those words, what are you going to find? More words. More words. Can you look up every word in the English language and get anywhere? No. No. I can't give you a dictionary from a language and say, here, go learn the language. You'll never figure out what a single word means. Because every time you look at a word, it just gives you more words. You go look up those words, it gives you more words. You go look up those words, it gives you more words. One of two things happens. Either you've got an infinite language with infinite words, or they circle. Well, in math, we don't want to use an infinite language with infinite words. And we don't want circular definitions. So in every system, you have to start out with what are called undefined terms. Terms that you're just not going to define. In mathematics, a common undefined term is set. If any of you took geometry, common undefined terms were point, line, plane. None of those things have definitions. We can't define them. 
So you have undefined terms. And once you have undefined terms, you can start creating definitions because now you have something to use. So you have undefined terms, you have definitions, which are uncomfortable with, and then you have what are called the axioms or the postulates. Those are the same thing. Those are just assumptions that you make. An assumption of geometry is that for any two points you have, there's a line and a unique line that goes through those points. That's not something you could ever prove in geometry. It's an assumption. Does that make sense? So we have our undefined terms, we, and then we have our definitions, and then we have our assumptions, which are just uh, statements that we assume are true, and then we're ready to kick off. We have everything we need to kick off. Once we have our assumptions, we can start looking at their logical implications. And we can say, well, if this is true and this is true, then this statement over here is true, right? Those two statements together imply that statement's true. And if I know that this is true and this is true, I can use those to find out that this is true. And showing that if these things are true, then this statement is true, is what we call a theorem. So you start out with your axioms, which are these assumptions, and then these are your theorems. And you start proving a whole bunch of theorems from there. So in Euclidean geometry, if you enter Euclid's elements, he only makes 10 assumptions in the whole book. Every theorem that he proves in that book comes from his 10 assumptions. He has five postulates and five are called common notions, but they're really just the same thing. They're all just axioms. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the bulk of math is once you got your undefined terms and once you got your assumptions, you can start using them to start creating definitions and, and produce theorems. Does that make sense? So a theorem is always of the form, if this is true, then this is true. Or if we're talking about this theorem, this theorem would say, if these two things are true, then this is true. Okay? Does that make sense? So a theorem is a proven mathematical statement. In other words, we demonstrated that it's the logical implication of statements we've already called true. We already called these two true, and we showed that this is the logical implication of those. We proved this from this. It's a proven mathematical statement. That then becomes a theorem. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what a theorem is. Now, theorems are about declarative statements. A declarative statement is something that is either true or false and typically has that word is in it. The sky is blue is a declarative statement. That statement is either true or it's false. There's no middle ground. An example of a non-declarative statement is Jack should wear a green hat. There's no really way to go about working with that. That's not a declarative statement. So the declarative statements usually have that is in it. 2 plus 2 is 4. Declarative statement. 2 plus 2 is 5. Declarative statement. With me? So the statements that we're looking at in mathematics are declarative statements. And if we demonstrate that that statement is always true, based off of what we've assumed to be true, then that statement becomes a theorem. So we have four classifications for these statements. One, if we prove that the statement is true, then we call it a theorem. Two, if we don't know whether or not the statement is true, but we strongly suspect it's true, we call it a conjecture. Three, if we know that the statement is false, we call that a mistake. You prove something that you're trying to show is true and you come out with false, you made a mistake. Something's wrong. Does that make sense? No? Does? All right. And finally, we have nonsense. The square root of a triangle is a circle. That's a declarative statement. Just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Good? Yeah. All right. So that's what a theorem is. And let's give you an example of a, Pyth of a theorem with a Pythagorean theorem, since it's like the one theorem kids know. What's a Pythagorean theorem? A plus B squared, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. <laughs> No, that is not the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem is, if A and B are the lengths of the legs of a right triangle, and C is the length of the hypotenuse, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is true only if these other things are true. So theorems are always in the form, 
or can always be reworded to be in the form of if A then B. If this condition is true, then this conclusion is true. Pythagorean theorem, you prove that if all the way here, here's where we specify all the conditions, if A and B are legs of a right triangle and C is the length of the hypotenuse, if that's true, then this conclusion is true. So theorems are in the if-then form. Any mathematical theorem can be restated in terms of if this, then this. The way that works with our picture is if this, then this. Does that make sense? All right. Let's hop into logic. I'm going to start with logic in a different place than the author starts. I like to start with logic with not. So a statement is something that's either true or false. One of the first laws of logic is called the law of contradiction. What does that mean? If a statement is not false, then it's true. If a statement is not true, then it's false. false. Does that make sense? Yes. OK, so a statement has to be either true or false. And we're just going to assume that if a statement's not false, then it's true. And if a, statement not, if a statement's not true, then it's false. The logic uh, operator for not is that symbol. So this is not. So that symbol means not. Let's see it in action. So I've got some statement A, and my statement A can either be true or it can be false. Those are the only values that that statement can take on, right? So A is just some generic statement. Could be the sky is blue. Could be Donnie's a purple dragon. A. And it's either true or it's false. If A is true, then not A is false. false. And if A is false, then not A is true. Wonderful. So that's how we apply the logic operator. Of the logic operator not. Logic operator not. Let's do that the other way. If I want to say not. And then here's the operator for it. Okay. Move on to the next logical operator. Next logical operator is and. Well, it doesn't matter what order you do these. Next one we'll cover is and. What does the word and mean? First off, we apply and to two statements simultaneously, right? I can't say, Donnie is holding a marker and, and have that statement make sense, right? I need two statements if I mean to use the word and. We call it the conjunction of two statements. So if I say, Donnie is holding a marker and Donnie is holding an eraser, is that statement true? All right, well, if I put that down. Donnie is holding a marker and Donnie is holding an eraser, is that statement true? No. So let's develop and all the way through. So, right here, yes. And our operator for and that we use is that symbol, a little upside down b. And let's look at all the possible combinations. So if we're going to talk about and, we need two statements. So I'll say statement A and statement B. And what are all the possible combinations? I could have A is true and B is true. I could have A is true and B is false. I could have A is false and B is true or I can have A is false and B is false. So picture A is a statement Donnie's holding a marker, and B is a statement Donnie's holding an eraser. So here setting up the top case. A is true and B is true, I'm holding both of them, right? Let's set up this case. Donnie's not holding a marker. Donnie's holding a marker is false. Donnie's holding an eraser is true. You see how this is setting up all the cases? This is I'm not holding either. This is I'm holding an eraser. This is I'm holding a marker. This is I'm holding both. You with me so far? So we set up all the possible combinations. Now we want to look at A and B. What does that look like? So if I'm holding a marker, if that's true, and the statement I'm holding an eraser is true, is the statement I'm holding a marker and I'm holding an eraser true? Yeah. When we set this top case, Right, that's true. All right, let's set the next case. So we said A is I'm holding a marker, B is I'm holding an eraser. Well, we'll put down the eraser, make I'm holding an eraser false. So I'm setting up this case. Is the statement Donnie's holding a marker and Donnie's holding an eraser true? No. 
No, it's not true. So what is it? False. False. Wonderful. Let's set the next case. Donnie's holding a marker is false. Make Donnie's holding a marker false. Make Donnie's holding a eraser true. Is a statement Donnie's holding a marker and Donnie's holding a eraser true? No. No? It's false. Perfect. So that's false. And then finally, if I'm not holding a marker and I'm not holding any eraser, is a statement I'm holding a marker and I'm holding a eraser true or false? False. False? Yes! Don't say you guess yourself because of the tone I use. <laughs> Alright. So that's and. Does that make sense? Yeah. An and statement is only true if both the statements I was using are true. If one of them is false, then the output is false. You with me? Yeah. All right, let's move on to or. Or is a little bit of a tricky one because in the English language we use or two ways. Or is the actual B, looking simple. They call it a wedge. All right, or we use two ways in the English language, so let's be clear which or we're talking about. If I say Donnie's in room two or Donnie's in room five, your brain typically interprets that as Donnie's in room two is true and Donnie's in room five is false, or Donnie's in room five is true and Donnie's in room two is false. That's kind of how your brain interprets that. Uh -huh. Your brain doesn't say that it's okay for me to be in two, room two and room five simultaneously, right? right? But if we go to this and I'm holding these two things and I make the statement, Donnie's holding a marker or Donnie's holding an eraser. Is that statement true? Yeah. Yeah. And you're now using or in a different sense. So what do we mean when we say or in mathematics? Because we have to use well-defined terms. At least one. We mean the latter. At least one of them is true. Good? Yeah. So when we say in mathematics, Donnie's in room two or Donnie's in room five, Donnie being in room two and five simultaneously is a valid outcome. But that still makes a statement true. true. Huh? If I'm in one, then that's true. If I'm in the other, then it's true. If I'm in both, then it's true. Does that make sense? That's the way that we use the word or in mathematics. So let's write out our truth table. So once again, or applies to two statements. I can't say Donnie's holding a marker or. Right? Doesn't make sense. So we need to talk about these two stu two statements. And the possible combinations are false, 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 true, 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 false. Right in a weird random order. So now let's look at it. Let's look at for each of those combinations whether the statement A or B is true. So if statement A is false and statement B is false, is the statement A or B true or false? False. False. All right, let's look at this one. If statement A is false and statement B is true, is the statement A or B true or false? True. True. If statement A is true and statement B is true, is the statement A or B true or false? True. True. And then for the last case? True. True. Perfect. Okay. Now we move on to our last logical operator, and then the rest are just created with these operators, and that is implies. And this is the hardest one for people to get. Chances are you'll make mistakes over and over again with the symbol. Uh, the author uses the double line arrow, I believe. So I'll try and remember to do that in this room. It implies either a double line arrow or a lot of textbooks just use a single arrow like that. But those are both the imply symbol. The way that imply symbols are uh, converted to English is with if then. If A, then B is the same thing as A implies B. Right? Okay, no. If, if A, A okay. then B if. is the same as A implies B. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this logical implication is if A, then B. The way, the way that you read this is A or B with implies, let me just write out the symbol, a implies B. A valid way to read that is if A, then B. You can also read that as A implies B if you want. You with me so far? Does that symbol make sense? 
So let's do the truth table for this one and see if we can appeal to your intuition. So once again, this is one that requires two statements. I can't say if Donnie's wearing his shoes, then and have it make sense. You keep waiting for the next statement, right? So let's fill out what are all the possible combinations. A can be true, B can be true. A can be true, B can be false. A can be false, B can be true. A can be false, B can be false, right? So all the possible combinations between A and B. All right, now just using our English, let's set up each case to see if we can make sense of it. So we'll set the first case. A will interpret as Donnie's holding a marker. B will interpret as Donnie's holding an eraser. So is the statement true that if Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser? No. That's not true? Yeah. Well, not, not necessarily, because if you're holding a marker, there's nothing to prove that you're holding an eraser. But if I'm holding a marker and I'm holding an eraser, if both those statements are true, okay. can we then conclude that if Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an, an eraser? Does that make sense if that statement's true? Yeah. That's a bad example, though. Why? Because usually you just use the marker and the eraser. Yeah. You can't think of a better one? I think it's perfectly good. Okay. Because then you can easily see what case I'm setting up. <clears throat> uh, let me point out a mistake real quick that students often make. They get caught up in the feasibility of the statement. So you're thinking, in the real world, is it possible for me to hold a marker and not hold an eraser? You might go down some avenue and you're thinking like that. You're overthinking it. Stop. If we know that the statement, Donnie is holding a marker, is true, and if we know that the statement, Donnie is holding an eraser, is true, is the statement that if Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser true? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that one's true. Now let's set the next case. This case, Donnie's holding a marker is true, Donnie's holding an eraser is false. Now let's make the statement. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. True. False. If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. False. I swear that you're not holding it. Right, I'm not holding it, it's false. If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Well, I'm holding a marker, I'm not holding an eraser. A implies B, but B is false. Right. A implies B, and one way to say that is if A is true, then B is true. If A is true, then B is true. Is that statement true? Um, You'll get caught on so this. So it's implies only true when it's double. So this is B. Well, we'll see. We're discovering. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so we're saying that this one was false, right? Right. Yes. Yes. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. False. No, that's false. Now here's where it gets real confusing. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. So this is where something that just feels so obvious suddenly becomes really useful. And that's this law of contradiction. So if I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Is the statement false? Not really. No. So if it's not false, then it's true. It's really hard for our brains for some reason to ask, is that statement true? That just tricks us. Wait. But if we ask, is that statement false, then we say no. How is it not false? If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Is that false? <laughs> there you go. Once it quits, it quits. Now, I promise you, over and over again this year, you're going to get stuck on that. Over and over again. You're going to think to yourself over and over again, wait, why was that true again? It's going to happen over and over again. I'm warning you right now. It's a hard one for our brains to stick with. So sometimes, think to yourself, if asking is that true is hard, maybe try asking is it false? Because if it's not false, then it's true. <laughs> then it's true. So this is true. All right, 
And for the grand finale. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. True. Is it false? Yes. True. You can say that that's false. That if I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Yes. How? Because if you were holding a marker, you're not holding an eraser. Well, yeah, but <laughs> if I was holding a marker, maybe in the process, I'd get an eraser. Yeah, but that's not what I didn't say if I'm not holding a marker or anything about it. I said if I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. True. Stop asking me the truth. Is it false? If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. I'm not holding a marker, so you can't see anything. You can't prove me wrong. So it's true. Let me try a different version. Every time I'm holding a marker, I'm holding an eraser, and I never hold either. Is the statement true or false? It's oh, true. Yeah. It's true. It's not false. That's not the same thing as saying what you're saying before. Yes, it is. You keep thinking, well, you can change the system. And you're overthinking it. You're thinking it's physically possible for me to then pick up a marker. No, you're changing the value of the statements when you do that. If this statement is false and this statement is false, you know the state of the system. If I'm not holding either, that's the state of the system. You don't say in time it can change. No, this isn't physics. You know this statement's false. You know this statement's false. Is this statement false? If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Is that statement false? No. No, you can't prove it's false. Is it false? It's not false. It's it's not true. True. If it's not false, then it's, it's true. But it's not true, so maybe it's You did you can't it conclude true. it's not true. The only way to conclude it's not true is to test it. You can't test it because it's what we call in math vacuously true. Let me give you another example. I can start any theorem in mathematics with the statement, if Donnie is a purple dragon, then you can put any statement you want right there, and the whole thing is going to be true. Because Donnie's not a purple dragon. Okay. Oh. It's vacuously true. You can't check any cases. There's no cases to check. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh. So when you start out with, if impossible statement, then, you can put whatever you want after the then. So if false, then, is always true. It's vacuously true. There's no cases to check. So false implies, it doesn't matter if you have true or false over here, if we start with false implies, the whole statement's automatically true. It's vacuously true. There's no cases to check. Right. It's like if I start out with an empty set, or here's another way to say it. I can say, every NBA player in this room is a billion feet tall. It's a true statement. There's no NBA players in this room. There's no cases that we can check that against. So it's like you can say anything you want about nothing. Oh. Right? Oh. <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. So this last one is true. And your intuition is going to struggle with this over and over and over again. I promise you that that's going to happen. Tough life. Got to get comfortable with it. All right. I have that up by now. I know you're one. And if you read through what the author says in reference to this, these types of statements, he'll walk you through a lot, a lot more English examples. So based off of how the statement is set up, maybe there's the right verb that you can plug in there to make it appeal to your intuition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you thought I was cheating when I switched to whenever, right? And something about your gut didn't lie up. So the author will walk you through. Sometimes there's different verbiage you can use that makes it appeal to your intuition. This textbook is so well done. I strongly recommend reading it. Like, there's saying, no better way to spend your time. You're saying read through it all the way before class, like before you before the next class kind of thing. Yeah, that's what I would do if I were you. Like all the way that's what I did. No, not the whole textbook. Oh, Sorry. Okay. No, yeah, like I'm saying class. <laughs> always have covered in reading what we're about to cover in class, okay. and you will always be well prepared. It's it's really hard to do bad in this class and do that. I I'd be impressed. But it's just impressive. <laughs> All right. And then we get to the last logical operator, which isn't really, it's just a combination of these. And it's the if and only if statement. We say A is true if and only if B is true. Uh, 
This is another way to say that is the two statements are logically equivalent. Another way to say that is if A is true, then B is true, and if A is false, then B is false. And another way to say it is A implies B and B implies A. So let's go over it and you'll get nice and comfortable. This is probably the easiest one out of these besides not. So the symbol is this, or this author probably uses a double arrow like that. It's a back and forth arrow. And what it's really shorthand for is, uh, we need to use it in context. So I'm going to say, statement A is logically equivalent to statement B, or statement A if and only if statement B. And I'm going to define what this means. You get with what I'm saying so far? Mm -hmm. So the way that we do that in terms of things that we already have written here is we say A implies B and B implies A. So this is shorthand for this. You with me so far? Now an interpretation of this is if A is true, then B is true, and if A is false, then B is false. Another interpretation of this is A and B have the same logical value. Another interpretation of this is A is true if and only if B is true. So we'll get comfortable with the language, but let's write out a truth table to see what exactly is happening here. So once again, this references two statements, so I need to write out all the possibilities for two statements. If I have two statements, stop using A and B in case that's confusing anyone. We're going to look at the statements. What should I use? Give me a variable. D and C. D and star. Okay. All right. D and star, in case my variables are throwing you off. Maybe that's two out there. Yeah. You got to hurry for that. Maybe second semester. We'll need to do some. All right. So D and E, what, what are all the possible combinations? So we can have true, 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 false, true, false, true, false, false, true, false, true, false, 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 false We'll write out its values. B implies A. We'll write out its values. And then A implies B and B implies A. Everyone understand what we're doing? Yeah. We're going to find out when this statement is true and false based off of knowing when these statements are true and false. That's what we're going to do. So let's start with filling in A implies B. Oh, sh I didn't use D and E. Yeah. It's easier to change these two. Yeah. That's not me trying to change convention, huh? <laughs> well, looks like you guys are stuck with those two. Anyways, so if A is true and B is true, does A imply B? Yes. True. If A is true and B is false, does A imply B? Compared to the two. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's false. Next. True. True. Next. Is true. Next. True. true. False implies false is true. False implies true is true. False implies anything, always true. Vacuously true. There's no cases to check. True implies false. False. True implies true. True. Okay. So now. Let's do B implies A. B implies A. True or false here? True. True. True or false here? True. False implies true. False implies true is? True. True. False implies anything is true. Yes. That includes false implies true. True implies false is? False. False. And false implies false is? True. Have you guys seen truth tables before? Yeah. No, no. Am I just way over emphasizing this? No, this is great. No, this is, this great. is good. I haven't seen okay. it. Okay. You haven't? If it feels tedious at any point, just let me know. Like, I want to like, bear down on you. What's one plus one? Two. What's that plus one? Three. What's that plus one? Four. You know? Those types of assignments. Yeah. 
when you're in third grade and they made you write the first 10,000 numbers? Yeah. That kind of stuff? You didn't have to do that? I have to do that. And I still remember it. I hated every second. Okay. So now let's look at this one. This one is saying this statement is true and this statement is true, right? Right. So true and true is? True. False and true is? True and false is? True and true is? True. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Is it? Aren't you going up and? I'm saying this and this. I'm saying this and this. I'm adding these two columns together. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So something that's false and true is obviously false. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so are you with me? Yeah. So notice that this was true only when A and B had the same values. It was true here when A and B were both true. It was true here when A and B were both false. So all this is a way of saying A and B have the same value where A and B are logically equivalent. You with me? Yes. All right. Now, let's get to English a little bit more to see if we can uh, break these down. I wonder if you have some good example statements to use with the if-then. All right, let's see if you can figure out what this means. Uh, if I say A, if, B, how can I express that logically? Meaning using these logical symbols. A, if, B, what does that mean? Or, let's put statements in there. What, what statement do you want? Pick something. Donnie is playing football if Donnie is wearing shoes. Okay. How do we break that up into a logical implication? Are you saying like those little symbol things? Yeah. Could you do like a backward one in time? A backward one? Yeah. What are you, I think you're getting there. You want to say that B implies A, right? Yeah. If I say A is true if B is true, that means B implies A. Yeah. Donnie is playing football if Donnie is wearing shoes means Donnie wearing shoes implies he's playing football. Right. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. You see that? And then we've got A only if B. This is A implies B. Donnie is wearing shoes only if he's playing football. That means if I'm wearing shoes, I'm playing football. It doesn't mean if I'm playing football, I'm wearing shoes, right? Donnie is wearing shoes only if he's playing football. Okay. You see that? You say, huh, huh? Wait. You say, uh, huh? <laughs> it's important to see that that's the way you convert both these things. A is true if B is true, means B implies A. A is true only if B is true, means A implies B. <coughs> because then we have A if and only if B. And then that is saying, B implies A, and A implies B. Or in other words, using our new symbol, right? If you can see those two, then this one should make perfect sense. We're handing them together. Right. A if and only if B, right. which is that, same thing which is what we define the symbol to be. So sometimes when we see that symbol, I'm going to read it as if and only if. Now, this is so common to want to do that we also have a shorthand for saying all this in English. Rather than writing out if and only if, we just write 
the double F in. And that is read as if and only if. To save on writing that a billion times. Right. Because it's common, it's common thing you want to say, if and only if. It's common that you want two things logically equivalent, or you talk about things that are logically equivalent. Sometimes we'll use them in definitions. This author likes to use the word provided a lot. A is even provided. You could just as easily say A is even if and only if, and then finish the statement that way. Good? Okay. And then we already talked about vacuously true. Right? Yes. Vacuously true statement is a statement where you can't check any cases. False. So the example the author gives is if an integer is a perfect square and a prime, that's not possible, right? Right. If an integer is a perfect square and a prime, do you know what a perfect square is? Yeah. What's a perfect square? 49. That's an example. It's a number. It's an integer multiplied by itself. It's an integer multiplied by itself, right? So it's always not prime. Good? So his statement is if an integer is both a perfect square and prime, then it is negative. If an integer is a perfect square and prime, then it's negative. Sounds like he's a dragon. It almost sounds like nonsense. A little bit. It almost sounds like nonsense. But it's not nonsense. Because we're we're still talking about can integers be perfect squares? Right. Can integers be prime? Yes. Can integers be negative? Yes. Yeah. This one doesn't make sense. Where do we have it? Because square root of a triangle, we don't know what that means. What do you mean square root of a triangle? Right. Okay. So there is a difference there. It almost feels like nonsense because your brain just knows it doesn't work. Okay. The reason your brain knows it doesn't work is because you're trying to deal with it vacuously true. Not the vacuous true too. Yeah. There's no condition to check. Okay. There are no perfect square prime integers. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me get, so that's it for lecture material. Got through that surprisingly quick. Ooh, we have a class on Friday too, don't we? Yes. Keep forgetting that. Uh, we're only going to go through three sections. Uh, we'll, let it be. we'll let it be, so we'll cap that for new material. Turn off the camera.